Hey there, my name is Sage, and today I'm going to be doing a deep dive into the Forge Domain Cleric. In this video, I'm going to discuss its features, its strengths, and its weaknesses, and I'm going to give an example build at the end of the video. Before getting started, I'd like to talk about how I personally evaluate subclasses. I like my subclass to be functional, but I also like it to be unique. So if the cleric has a feature that is stronger than the subclasses, but the subclasses is unique, I'm going to use the subclass feature over the clerics if they compete. What can I say? I like my characters quirky. So without further ado, it's Forge Domain Cleric time. At level one, we get heavy armor proficiency as well as Smith's tools proficiency. We get the blessing of the forge feature and the searing smite and identify spells. Heavy armor proficiency along with the shield means we're going to start the game off with a solid 18 AC. And we can expect once we get plate to cap out at 20 AC. That cap out that I just said has an asterisk though because of our feature blessing of the forge. This feature lets us change a normal weapon or piece of armor to a plus one weapon or armor armor at the beginning of the day. This is super versatile because as your party gets more magic weapons, you can adjust it to where it's needed and where there are gaps. One of those gaps is often going to be AC and it's just a really solid choice to be throwing it on yourself so you get that to that 21 AC, which is a really fantastic AC. If you have a fighter with multiple attacks, it might be good to put the magic on its weapon so that when we fight something with resistance to non-magical bludgeoning, slashing, and piercing damage, that we have a strong fighter still. So like I said, all about versatility. As for our Smith's Tools proficiency, it's a really fun proficiency where we can craft our own armor. And something I want everybody to keep in mind is by being proficient in tools, it suggests that you have knowledge about being a Smith, which can come in use in other situations. For example, you understand metal, so you might be able to break through a door by examining it to find metallic weaknesses. Keep an open mind when it comes to your tool proficiencies. I think they're cooler than most people let on. Moving into our spells, we'll start with identify. Now considering that we can identify as a short rest, it's really not a huge deal, but being able to do it in 10 minutes as opposed to an hour can help. For me personally, I like to take the identify away from short rests and make it so they either have to experiment with the magical item or use identify, which would increase its value a lot. And I like running it that way. Either way you go though, the potentially bigger use case is that you can cast identify on a person to read magical ailments off them. So if someone's suffering from something magical, Identify can come in to help you understand what it is. As for Searing Smite, it does a bit of extra damage and lights our enemy on fire. Unlike most saves, this one happens at the beginning of their turn instead of the end of it. And it's a constitution save, which is the worst of the saves because most creatures are really good at con saves. So it's unreliable because you're gonna hit them, it's gonna light them on fire, and it may get through the save. And when it does, somebody can use their action to pat it out, whether it be their teammate or themselves. I'm not gonna say it's useless, but compared to your other level one spells like Bless, Guiding Bolt, and Inflict Wounds, I just don't see myself using this one that often, unless I'm going for a really heavy, fiery type flavor. At level two, we get our Channel Divinity Artisan's Blessing. This is a purely utility-based Channel Divinity. We can use this to turn our gold into useful situational items if we have an hour to do so. So it'll never be useful to us in a way that is quick. It is always something that we have to pre-plan. So it's not a spontaneous reaction to situations, it's a planned one. However, if you're stuck in a hole, you have nothing else to do but plan, so you can change your gold into a ladder and climb out. You can do all sorts of things with this. It is a utility item in your gold. As long as it has metal in it, you can make all sorts of equipment. Grappling hooks, 10-foot poles, climbing hooks, battering rams. I mean, the list is endless. Not only that, you can also do it in the reverse. You can change a bunch of random items into gold. Your party may not be willing to lift out all that bandit armor, but if you guys are willing to take an hour, you can transform that bandit armor into easily portable gold, and so your party overall would make more money. It's a early level money making option. Now for me personally, when I look at plate armor, I don't think of it as a single piece. So I would allow Artisan's Blessing to be used over time to build sections of the armor. Now the only exception to that is the breastplate because the breastplate costs 400 gold to purchase, which is outside of our 100 gold cap. We can, however, do the pauldrons, the gauntlets, and so on. But that's just me as a DM. Talk to your DM before deciding you can do that. I imagine that if we're having combat throughout the day, we're probably gonna use our channel divinity to get our spell slots back. But on days off 
and when we get into a sticky situation and need an option out, Artisan's Blessing will be there to cover us. At level 3, we get the Heat Metal and Magic Weapon spells. Magic Weapon has a specific niche where if we ran into a situation where there is a creature with bludgeoning, slashing, and piercing non-magical immunity or resistance, and we don't have a fighter with a weapon to deal with that, we can cast it so they can now do actually good damage. Though I will say that this has some redundancy with our ability to just give magic weapons as is. But by having this, it kind of convinces us or incentivizes us to take the plus one to our AC, and so we can use this to give the magic weapon when needed. As for Heat Metal, it's an incredibly situational spell, but in the situations it's good, it's really good. So it's nice to have always on our spell list for when those situations pop up. And the situation I'm talking about is when you can cast it on an enemy who can't remove the metal easily. A knight in heavy armor is going to get absolutely wrecked by Heat Metal. At fifth level, we get Elemental Weapon and Protection from Energy. Elemental Weapon has a lot of redundancy with our magic weapon, and the only use case above it is that if we find someone who's vulnerable to an energy type damage, we can cast this so they have the magic weapon and they're doing that energy damage. Protection from energy is a defensive concentration ability, so I try to lean away from concentrating on defensive abilities more often than not, because our win condition is usually killing them before they kill us, but if our win condition is making sure our archer survives long enough to do a lot of damage to the dragon, making it survive that breath weapon attack can be a huge deal. That's when protection of energy comes in. At level 6, we get Soul of the Forge. If we were wearing heavy armor, we just get a plus 1 to AC, and we have resistance to fire damage now. Simple, strong, effective, defensive feature. We now have a whopping 22 AC, and there is no other full caster that's going to get near that. At level 7, we get Fabricate and Wall of Fire. Wall of Fire is an excellent control spell with high damage potential if we have party members who can force movement. But even if we don't, we can use it to split the combat so their backline is split from their front line. Now, if their backline wants to support, they have to walk through fire, taking a bunch of damage, and then they're out of position. Or they can not move and then you have them split, you can divide and conquer. Or the front line can retreat through the fire, doing a bunch of damage to themselves and splitting you and their party away from each other. And so if you want to retreat, you can. And if you want to chase, you can just end concentration. Super versatile spell, super awesome. And it gives us battlefield control, which as a cleric, we're usually lacking. Fabricate is a really interesting spell. We have to take material from one thing and change it into another. Equivalent exchange, full metal alchemist style. Now this creation needs to fit within a five foot cube, and you can't create things that require a lot of skill unless you have proficiency. So since we have smithing tool proficiency, we can make armor from creation, which can be a nice money-making tactic. You just use creation to change a bunch of metal into a bunch of plate armor and then go sell it. Over time, you could build fortifications. So it might take two or three days, but if you know where the battlefield's going to be, you can set up archery towers or spiked barricades. You can do all sorts of things. The spell is only really limited by your creativity and your DM's interpretation of it. At level 8, we either get Blessed or Divine Strikes. Blessed Strikes have a better attack type being Radiant over Fire, as well as boost your cantrips, whereas Divine gives you that extra D8 at level 14, but it's only going to work on your weapon attacks. Overall, Blessed Strikes are better, but if you're going for that really fiery flavor, Go for your Divine Strikes, live your best life. Our fifth level spells are Creation and Animate Objects. Animate Objects is a pretty rare summoning spell for clerics. They usually can only summon Celestials. But Animate Objects can absolutely chew through enemies. It does a ton of damage if you choose the option that makes eight small creatures. Keep in mind, however, that rolling eight dice can be a slog on combat speed. So make sure that you come prepared and that you roll fast and that you make sure you're aware of how much time you're taking. Just be kind to the players around you. Creation is another high creativity versatile spell. You create anything in a five foot queue and it lasts depending on what you created material. So if you create something with iron, it's gonna last a lot longer than something with adamantine. Basically the more valuable it is, the shorter it's gonna last. This is a super high-end creative spell, and if you're being chased in a hallway, make a five-feet block of concrete that they have to get through now, blocking the hallway. Are you up a hill? 
Create an Indiana Jones boulder and roll it down. Do you have a way to fly? Create adamantine bombs from the sky that just, you know, inertia type weapons to go through the castle ceiling before you enter. I think the more creative you are, this, the more this spell will reward you. At level 17, we get our capstone subclass feature and it does not disappoint. It gives us immunity to fire and it gives us resistance to all non-magical slashing, piercing, and bludgeoning damage, which is still super common even at this level. If we weren't tanky before, we are now insanely tanky. Eat your heart out, Barbarian. Moving into our build, our role is crystal clear. We are a frontline gish tank. We wear heavy armor and get into the thick of battle. And because we're always going to be in the thick of battle and we don't have martial weapon proficiency, I think I'm always going to choose a race that gives us martial weapon proficiency. Dwarves and elves are clear standouts here. I like the high elf because you can get the booming blade cantrip, and with the warcaster feat you can cast it on reaction, as well as it just giving you a damage boost in general. But the hill dwarf is also an excellent option with its extra tankiness. Another one I'll note that doesn't have martial weapon proficiency is the mark of creation human. They just go together like bread and butter. There's a lot of redundancy in their spell list, but their flavor is just so combined that I would consider it. Now, here's the thing about clerics. Spirit Guardians is a really, really good spell. However, its best positioning is on the front line, so there's a lot of clerics in the back line who can't utilize it, this spell to the fullest. We can. And not only can we do it good, we do it better than anyone else because our AC is so high that we're not going to be getting hit as often, so we're not going to have to be rolling concentration saves as often, meaning we have a more reliable Spirit Guardians than any other Cleric. So I would say Forge Domain is a Spirit Guardian Specialist. And as simple as that sounds, that is a devastating build just to chew people up with Spirit Guardians. So, say we're a High Elf, we have Booming Blade, we have our Spirit Guardians going, going so we can action, Booming Blade, Spirit Guardians, choose them up. Bonus action, spiritual weapon, then they're trying to move away from us, now they're moving at half speed, and they get reaction tag booming blade. We are a blender of death on the front line, and we're tanky as hell. Now for me, I'm going to focus a lot on fabricate, creation, and our channel divinity to create items. I think that's something this character needs to be doing on top of, in our downtime, be taking advantage of our smithing tool proficiency, be smithing stuff. Whether that be weapons, armors, make sure our team is nice and kitted out, or it could be making money, or it could just be doing art. I think that would be a big part of the roleplay for me. At the end of the day, the Forge Domain Cleric is a super simple, straightforward build. I'd say it's really good for beginners who are getting into the game. It's a great Cleric for them because it's just straightforward, but good at the same time. It doesn't take a lot of optimization to make it good, it's just good. So I really recommend it for that. Now, if we're a little bit more of an experienced player or a creative player, lean more into the creation, the fabricate, our channel divinity, and our Smith's Tools proficiencies to be able to feed that creative side. And once we're leaning into that portion of the subclass, really the sky is the limit of what we can do. All right, now it's time I hear from you. Tell me what you would do with a Forged Domain Cleric. Tell me what I missed. Let me know in the comments down below. We are D&D Daily. We release new D&D content every single day, so if that's interesting to you, hit the subscribe button, and I'll see you on the next one. Later.